I tell you what's taken me a long time, and I've only done it in the last two or three years, which is taking control of myself. Mm. I've, you know, in my, it's taken me till my mid fifties to actually make my own decisions. I'm still very aware of how big the Nolan sisters were, right? Mm. But talk me through that time of your life. Like, what was it like? How big were you? We sold 30 million records, yeah. and yet we didn't get any money. We signed all sorts of deals that we didn't know about and we didn't have help with and basically signed our lives away. We were the only ones out of all of that that didn't make any money. I always wanted an element of normality, which I never felt I had as a child. And so now home is the most important place for me. As soon as I walk through that front door, I'm in my element. All those dogs bark and drive me mad and I think I've got to feed the goats, you know. It's <laughs> <laughs> just a random thing to have, isn't it, really? I can't please everyone, and if I don't please you, or you hate me, or you think I'm this, that, and the other, there's nothing I can do about it, because I quite like me. Just feel the fear and do it anyway? Yeah. Just don't have regrets. Yeah. Just think about, if I'm lying there at the end of my life thinking, wish I'd have done that, or why didn't I at least try? The failure comes from not even trying. Oh my way. god! Oh my god! How are you? Look yeah, at you. I know, I'm, I'm, I'm the tall one. How are you? I'm all right. You smell I'm nice. Really oh, hi. Have you ever been to Stock Exchange? It's Manchester's best kept secret. Hi, I'm Colleen Nolan, and I'm doing the Learning As I Go podcast. Woo! That's good! <laughs> You didn't wait till she did the actual flip then, guys. Oh, they didn't. They, they were a bit, in. a bit premature. Oh, how special is this? Thank you so much, Colleen, to take a step out of your busy schedule <laughs> to come and join me for a conversation. I was so thrilled when I found out. Honestly, it was a yes, 100%. I'm still very aware of how big the Nolan sisters were, right? Mm. But talk me through that time of your life. Like, what was it like? How big were you? I've always been big, Scott, <laughs> to be fair. <laughs> you know, but if we're talking records... um. Huge in Japan. It's a running joke with um, loose women because I constantly go, yes, but I was huge in Japan. Japan, you, wait, you yeah, really? Japan was the main what? place. Yeah, we broke all records in Japan. Sold Why more Japan? than the Beatles over there. And I think because they're very, very, very family orientated. And remember, I was 15 at the time no when we did all of that. So, yeah, it was all about family. And, you know, they've got such a young um, core fans over there. And... They were all about my age, about 14 or 15. And it was just crazy because we'd go from like touring here, which was lovely and great. But when we went to Japan, it was one of them. We had to be um, taken around by the army. No way. Yeah, because we couldn't, we weren't allowed to leave hotels or anything because we'd just get mobbed. And we'd never had that over here. Um, so it was a real, it was great actually. It was quite exciting at the time. But um, yeah, we used to go over there two or three times a year for eight weeks at a time and no then way. fly on to Australia. Uh, yeah, so it was an amazing. It was an amazing time, but I actually didn't appreciate it till later on in life. And why was that? so? This was like the late seventies, early eighties. Is that right? Eighties, yeah, early eighties. So, so mainly the eighties then. Yeah. So how did it all come about? You got you getting into a band with you, um, your sisters. I've sang since the age of two with my whole family. My whole family, all ten of us, used to sing. Mum, dad, six girls, two boys. We did all the clubs in the north and. Well, everywhere, really, all the working men's clubs. Um, and apparently when I was born, the first thing they said was, God, I hope she can sing. Really? <laughs> I went, that would have been awkward if I couldn't have. Um, they also shoved me in a drawer because there was no room. But anyway, um, wow, was it, it's not troubled come, me at did all. Did you come back from, like, humble... Did you come? Oh, my God, we rooms? lived in a three-bedroom terraced house in Blackpool, ten of us, you can imagine. Um, my brothers never saw the bathroom. Um, they had to go to the pub to get... To use a shower, um, so yeah, it was it was very humble. My mum and dad were quite poor, and that's why we all were singing. You know, that's how we made our living, really. Um, so I did that from the age of two, and then we got discovered in Blackpool. I was nine at the time. We got discovered by a big management company, who then brought us to London. And then our first time on the on television was when I was nine, and we did the Cliff Richard series. And then two Ronnies and Mike Yarwood and all that. We did all those series. Um, Vince Hill, you won't remember any of these, but yeah. Uh, we did all of that. And then the records started happening. By which time my two brothers, my two brothers didn't come to London with us because they were engaged at the time, so they wanted to stay in Blackpool. My mum and dad took a step down and my sister Denise was very into doing all the standard stuff, you know, Sinatra and all that. She didn't like the pop stuff. So she went off and did her own career. 
and then the rest of us carried on. It's crazy the way you talk about it because you just talk about it like it's second nature. I think because you were so young, has it always just been part of your life? That Yeah, it's really weird, Scott, because people say to me, what's it like being a celebrity? You know, when people go, what's it like? And I don't think of myself as that because it's just something that's just always been... It's just something I've always done. Since a really, really early age, it's just been a, a job. Don't get me wrong, I love it and thank God for it. But its I don't feel any different to how I did when I was a kid. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it is, it is a weird one. So if I was to ask you what was the big moment when you got discovered, you talked about getting discovered in Blackpool, mm. was it? Yeah. Like, was that like a, a massive moment for you or was it just something well, you again, remember? Um, I was, what, eight or nine? I was right. eight then. So eight years old, I don't think you... I don't think you think like that. You know, I just I just knew that all of a sudden we were uprooting and being moved to London. Um, but I know for my family, I mean, I know that the day we were discovered, we were really, really, really angry with my dad because we never worked Christmas Day. That was, you know, that we're all obsessed with Christmas. And that was the one day we didn't work. And he'd signed us up to work at a hotel in Blackpool, Cliff's Hotel in Blackpool on Christmas Day. And none of us were speaking to him. It was like... I was crying, I didn't want to do it, you know, I wanted to play with my toys. Anyway, we did it, and that's where this management company was. So when you, you talk about working from an early age, do you mean you were gigging around hotels and stuff at the age of nine? From the age of two. No way. Oh, really? Two when I went on stage, yeah. What? I yeah. thought you were, like, exaggerating that. Did no, no, from the age working? of two, yeah. We used to do travels to Scotland, Wales, um, all over British Isles and... Everywhere, and we'd go on in the... And, you know, working men's clubs back in... Well, you won't, you're too young. But back in the day, you went on and did four spots a night of, like, 45, and we'd be there till 2, 3 in the morning. So that's what we did, and I didn't know anything different. Mm. Um, but looking back, Colleen, now, and I'm going to get a little bit, like, therapy on you. Oh. Like, because obviously, every time I sit down with my therapist, mm. every behaviour, every thing that I do, he always relates it back to childhood. Oh, yeah, like, definitely. I'm, I'm guessing now you've obviously got a lot of self-awareness. Yeah. And that was, like, work from a very early age. Mm. How do you think that's impacted you as you've got older? What, do you feel like you lost out on a childhood? Um, I feel really guilty saying I lost out on a childhood because equally, you know, when my friends were 15 or 16, some of them had never left Blackpool mm. and I was here going to Japan, Australia, Singapore, you know, travelling around... Did I miss out on a normal childhood? Yeah. And when I was very young, you know, when I was nine or ten, there was times I didn't want to go because I was obsessed with horses, so I wanted to go and be at the stables with all my friends mucking out. I remember at seven I cried because all my friends were joining the brownies that night. Yeah, so I remember that particular day crying because we were had to go to Scotland or somewhere to a working men's club, and I just really wanted to join the brownies, and I couldn't because we were gigging. So little things like that. I think it changed me when I became a parent because I was determined that my kids were going to go to school and stay. I mean, I hardly went to school because we were always working. We're getting up four in the morning, you know. Mm. Um, God love my mother because she did it all really, but, you know, getting us up for school. and. So who was the one steering the ship then? Was it your mum or your dad? Um, I think my dad on the whole was making decisions, but my mum was the one then organising all the kids, you know, eight kids and then getting them all home, and she used to make our costumes, and then getting us up for school. You know, my mum slept on the couch for years, and she'd be up lighting the fire before we all got up for school, things like that. She was amazing. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think she kept it all together, really, but my dad was the one that did all the business side of stuff. Mm. And, and was it a lucrative business? Because I've read some articles before saying... Uh, someone's made a lot of money. Or oh, sort of the quote was someone's made oh, a lot of money. Oh, well, you but... said at the beginning, you know, we sold 30 million records yeah. and yet we didn't get any money from that. But I don't get it. If your dad's running the business, how did that No, happen? because at that point when it became big business and he ran it when we were doing working men's clubs. Right. So he got the payment for that. But when we we then got discovered, we signed all sorts of deals that we didn't know about and we didn't have help with and basically signed our lives away and... We were the only ones out of all of that that didn't make any money. You know, because technically, 30 million records, we should all be not having to work or choosing when we want to work, but we can't. You know, I still have to work to pay a mortgage. Mm. So who um, was taking the money? The record labels? Record labels, accountants, um, everyone, management companies. We didn't realise that everything... They, like, when we'd go on tour, they'd throw... Or we would go to Top of the Pop, say, they'd send this amazing limousine or they'd throw a big end of tour party for hundreds of people 
we didn't know till much later on that we were paying for all that. We just mm. thought, aren't they lovely, the record company, mm. sending us cars and putting us these lavish parties on, not realising that it was all coming out of our money. Well, you hear about this a lot in the industry, mm. where a lot of stars kind of get misled. Uh, and... Especially that era. Yeah. Like the Bay City Rollers were the same. They, I mean, they were massive and they didn't make any money. There seems to be lots of people from 70s, 80s that... You know, our record deal was something like 10 years. Who signs a 10-year deal with anyone? And the management company that brought us to London were taking a piece of that, even though we left them years before. They were still taking a piece of it, saying, well, we discovered them. Mm. So all this was happening, and we just didn't know enough to mm. question well, this, it. This links back to something that I'm really passionate about at the moment, and I put a little post out about it recently saying that, one thing that everybody needs to do is like focus on the finances because you don't you don't get taught in school, no. and which I've you should it, be. And obviously, we, we manage a lot of like talent now, the social PR, mm. and they come off these shows like Love Island, yeah. and they start making lots of money, but they don't have a clue what VAT is, what tax is, no. and everything else. Like, did it take you a long time to to learn those skills? Still don't know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> Difficult. Still ask about tax. Yeah. Um, I seem to just constantly work for the tax man. That's all I know. Yeah. I say everything I do. I think, oh, he's getting that or she. Um, I tell you what's taken me a long time, and I've only done it in the last two or three years, which is taking control of myself. Ooh. I've, you know, in my, it's taken me till my mid fifties to actually take, make my own decisions, and not be scared to say no of things that I feel uncomfortable about or I don't want to do, and I question things now, and I kind of that feels very empowering for me now. But it's taken me till my fifties, mm. whereas my daughter, who's twenty two. Um, although she's not in business or anything yet, she's travelling at the moment, but she's already so much more clued up than I was at 22. You, you know, she's she questions everything and she's better already with money and probably from watching me be useless with it. Um, <laughs> yeah, she's probably thinking I'm not going to be my mother. Um, but, yeah, it's taken me a long time to... Um, I think coming from a big family, doing what we did since the age of two up until present day... But being the baby of the family, I just let everyone else do everything. Um, you know, if they were doing it, I'd go, oh, okay. You know, I'd never go, actually, I don't I don't want to do that. Whereas now I've got to a point where I go, as my manager, Feeling will tell you, he phones me up with things sometimes and I go, no, I don't feel comfortable doing it. I don't want to. Whereas before I was such a, oh, I better because they might not ask me again or... Well, you know, okay, they might not, but... Yeah, people yeah. pleasing. I just got goosebumps when you said that because that's something that I've been thinking about a lot recently. I was on the phone to my mum the other day, actually, and I was telling her, going, listen, I've got all these businesses and stuff, and I've always been a high achiever because mm. from the age of six, for some reason, they discovered that I was quite intelligent, my family. Really? And the next thing, I got pushed through private school, and all my life I was spending hours doing homework and, and getting A stars and everything else. And I felt like that's who I was. Mm. And as I've got older now, like I've realized that I love doing this kind of stuff. Yeah. I love being in front of the camera. I love presenting, mm. but I've got these two businesses that I do love elements of them. Don't get me wrong, but I don't want to be a full-time businessman. Like I do want to be a little bit more like my brothers. My mum said on the phone, she went, I wonder Scott, if it was like, she said, if it was my fault that I pushed you down that route. I said, it's not your fault, but it's weird how you just, you sometimes follow a path because, especially when you think your parents want it or your family uh, I wants think, it. I think parents are very influential. You know, mm. I, I look at my kids now and we've sat down loads of times and have, have these discussions and I think without meaning to, because no parent means to do that, mm. but subconsciously I think you do things that you look back on now and think, oh, I think that might have been my fault because they thought that that's what I wanted mm. them. You know, my my kids felt very under pressure, I think, um, well, certainly Kira did, and this is what I mean about how strong she is. The boys wanted to be in the industry, mm -hmm. but Kira never did. But she really felt under pressure to be because she's got a really great voice. She can write really great songs. And I kept going, oh, my God, get in there, write some more songs, record this, you know, do this. And eventually she turned around and went, I don't want to. And it was like, oh. You know what I mean? But I, I admire her for having... The courage, and she said, I feel under so much pressure from everyone that I should be singing or I should be doing this because you did or because my brothers mm. do, and I don't want to. And she doesn't want to, and I really respect that now, mm. and I'm glad she's realised that at such such a young age. Mm. But there's certain things where I've done and, you know, the boys or Kira will go, well, that's because you said that or you did this, like you don't have enough mum guilt in your life, you know. Mm. But they don't say it horribly or accusatory it's just 
I think I'm like this because you did this. And I go, yeah, because I know I did a lot of things. You know, I grew up thinking I'm never going to say what my mum's, you know, I'm never going to say to my kids what my mum used to say to me. And then all of a sudden you hear yourself mm -hmm. and you think, oh, my God, I am my mother, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I think it is, you know, parents have a lot of responsibility and, but you can't be perfect. You can only be the best you can be, you know. Yeah, 100%. I think it comes down to boundaries. And it seems like you're getting to the point in your life now where you're starting to respect your own boundaries because I've not respected mine for mm. so long. Like, I've been a people pleaser, crowd pleaser. That's why I, I used to drink a lot mm. because I felt like that made me cool. When I was growing up, being like ultimate party boy made yeah. me cool. Whereas now I'm getting to the point where, and it's so difficult saying no because it at is. first you piss people off, right? Mm. And and it's that immediate reaction where they kind of look at you and go like, oh. But then over time, I actually think you earn their respect if that makes sense, when you start to protect your own boundaries. I think you do, and I think they stop taking advantage yes. of you. And and also then what happens is then when you do do stuff, like well, I'm doing this today because I really wanted to, mm -hmm. you know, I was thrilled when you asked me, but equally I've turned down others, where, whereas before I'd have just said yes to everything. Mm -hmm. And now it's made me enjoy what I do so much more. Um, yeah, I just... Do you think you're in a position now, the way, a privileged position a little bit, clean, where you can actually... You can choose more what you can and don't do. Or, or Oh, no. No? No, because that would mean I'd be financially in a position to do that. Yeah. There's certain things that I go, don't really want to do that, but there's a lot of money, so I'll have to. Right, okay. Because I've still got a mortgage. I've yeah, got all yeah. these animals to pay for. <laughs> it is a job. Do you know what I mean? I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just laughing. <laughs> We're going to get to animals. <laughs> but what I mean is I do, my kids have left home now, so now it's all about, before it was, well, I have to, I have kids. Now it's, well, I've no kids, but I've got animals. I've still got to pay bills. Mm. Um. Yeah, no, there's certain things, you know, you do have to say yes to certain yeah. things that you might think, mm, no, I'm not excited about it, but I'll do it. Um, I didn't, sorry, when I said privilege, I didn't mean like, oh, you don't have to work or anything like that. Yeah. I meant like, it's almost like, I think it's maybe the privilege of knowing and understanding who you are now, actually. I think, which is, you, you can only get with age and experience, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's, it's understanding who you are and it's accepting who you are. And mm. it's stop, and like you said, I'm a pro proper people pleaser and I get hurt by things and comments and nastiness. I hate it. Um, but it's also accepting who you are and realising that you can't please everyone. And if I don't please you or you hate me or you think I'm this, that and the other, there's nothing I can do about it because I quite like me mm. and the people I care about like me. So Are you I, an overthinker by any chance? Yes, massively. <laughs> so, so much. The reason why I mention that is because... I realized I'm an overthinker, right? To the point where my brain is in overdrive all the time. And when someone says, you know what, Scott, you're just, you're overthinking it. Like just, and I've just realized like, and because I've been doing a bit of research now, listening to podcasts and like there's certain type of personalities who are like, and it's, it's almost like genetic sometimes. Yeah. You can't stop it. And I've been beating myself up thinking, why am I such an overthinker? Why am I this? And I think, yeah. you know what? No, that's who I am, mm. right? I'm not like everybody else. There are super laid back people over there and there's mm. proper chill and they're, and they're amazing. Overthinking is also my superpower. It makes me really driven and helps me with so many different things as well. But I think it's, I'm getting to the point where I'm going, do you know what? That is who I am. I'm being a bit more comfortable with that. Yeah, I think I am. So, I mean, it's it's weird to say I'm that, I'm overthinker, because my family have always said, I'm, you know, about me, oh, she's so laid back, she's almost horizontal, which I am kind of laid back. I'm, You know, I don't get screamy, shouty, stressed about anything. But I think it's all internal. Mm. I analyze everything internally mm. and keeps me awake that. sometimes yeah. at night, you know, when you mm. sit there, you're lying in bed going, oh God, did I upset that person? Did I mean that? Or do I want to do that? Can I say no? You know, all these things. Um, you're a ruminator. Sorry, the reason why I said that, because I'm, I just listened to a podcast yesterday, and there were certain different like personality mm. traits. And he says like there's a creative and they're like, they're almost, and basically ruminate. And it sounds like you are, but you're not like reactive. I think I'm quite reactive sometimes. Whereas yeah, it sounds not, like I'm not reactive, as in a screaming. I'm so like sorry, that. by the way. I'm sat here in my therapy chair, like trying to like pass out prescriptions. It's just because I'm. I mean, I, just, I, I feel like I'm having free therapy. No, no, no. Because it is. Because my brother Adam said to me, he said Scott, you're gonna end up being a therapist, you know? Because I'm always analysing him. He went looking for a car the other day. I went, you're having a midlife crisis, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but no. Um, <laughs> No, I just think the reason why I'm saying it is because I'm, I'm just really intrigued now because I think I've beaten myself up for so long with certain with some of my personality traits. Mm. And it sounds like you're at this point now 
where you really just are understanding. I am understanding. I ha- I'm still very, very insecure about myself. Mm. I still question why someone, you know, I still get thrilled when people recognize me. Mm. I still get thrilled when people want an autograph because I think, why? You know, really? To this day? Yeah, honestly, I get really, I'm thrilled by it and humbled by it, but I find it fascinating. And I still, um, I still don't, I still feel like a fraud. Really? Yeah, I feel I've got, what's it called? Imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome, massively, yeah. But you've been doing it since you were like two. I know, but I think I think probably because of that, because I didn't have that moment growing up as a kid thinking, oh my God, I, I want to be a pop star or I want to be a TV presenter and you work on it and you, it just all happened. So for me, it just feels like a job and I'm too stupid to do anything else, you know, because I miss most of school. Um... So it's just always felt part of my life. And also being the baby of the family, I just kind of went along with everything. And now sometimes when I'm doing what I'm doing, I get so nervous about it because I think, I, I don't know if I can do this. I have to really force myself to do things because if I listened to my insecure side, I wouldn't do anything. I'd say no to everything because the majority of the time I think I can't do this. Oh, do you know what? That's that's me to a T. Like I wake up this morning and from the outside looking at you think, right, he's super confident, he's mm. driven, everything else. But I have to literally, it's like I've got two Scots running in my, mm. in my head. It's like one Scot is like super motivated. We're going to smash this day. But I literally have to beat up the other Scot who's going, Scott, you, it's going to be a stressful one today. Yeah. You can't do this. You can't do it. There's no point. Stay in bed. Yeah. I'm literally like fighting against that voice. But the then day. I have this other thing. I don't know if you do this. I see sometimes people on telly or whatever, they're doing something. And, and then my other side of me goes, you could have done that better than that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I would never have the nerve to put myself forward for it. Yeah, it's weird. It's like... I, is that a sense of... Is that a fear of failure? I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe it's... No, I don't know. I mean, I had to be really... For instance, Dancing on Ice, I said, no, 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 absolutely not. And my manager at the time literally phoned me up and said, I've signed it. And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> and she was singing the theme tune down the phone. And I was like, you better be winding me up. She said, no, because I know it's good for you. And I know... And every week... That was the moment of that saying, feel the fear and do it anyway. I remember watching that series, actually. I was always really scared for you. <laughs> Horrendous. Um, well, it was great. But, I mean, I, all of everything about that series was brilliant, apart from the ice. Yeah. Didn't like the ice. Who was on that the series again? Who was on it with you? It was Ray Quinn that won it. Oh, God. And um, yeah, it Todd Carty went down the tunnel, remember? He yes. tripped up and flew down the tunnel. Best moment in television. Um, yeah, there was, there was loads on that. Um uh, but yeah, and now when I'm scared, I always say to myself, "You can because you've done you've you've danced on ice. But you can do it." But wait a second, let's talk about. It. So I had Russell Kane on, on my podcast, a comedian. I'm always fascinated about about by um, the confidence it must take to go out on stage and make people laugh. Comedians, I think that's the hardest job I know, in the world, and, and they make it just sound so easy. But even for you, Colleen, like the fact that you still get nervous and scared when you've always been on stage um, performing in, in front of thousands, I'm sure, like. How have you not overcome that that level of insecurity or confidence? Well, it's really weird because I, f- I feel it to the point of I don't know if I can go on. But from the moment, I still get it for loose women. You know, when we're waiting backstage and I've been doing that 23 years and the music starts and I always get that, oh, God, I don't know. But then as soon as I walk out or as soon as I walk on stage, it goes and I'm in the moment and I love it. But if I let it overwhelm me... I would not go on. Mm. I would go, no, I can't. So it's that it's that line of push yourself over because you know once you're out there, you'll be fine. But mm. if I got to a point where I thought I can't, then that'd be the time I'd have to give up. I mean, I'm now going on my first ever solo tour. I've heard. Yeah. Naked tour? Naked, yeah. Why is it called naked? I'm because sure. I'm very vulnerable and very. Ex- I feel very exposed because wow. it's the first time on my own, so... Naked is a perfect way to describe that because I actually do feel it's as scary as that. It's as scary as walking out in front of a thousand people naked because that's what it feels like. And I'm absolutely terrified, like sleepless nights. We're in the middle of rehearsals. I open on Friday the 9th and I'm terrified. But I'm also at that point where I think, well, it's too late now. You've, you know, you're too close. You can't now go, I'm not doing it. Um, but I feel like someone will have to be in the wings and just give me a little push out. <laughs> but I love this, though, because I feel like you feel the fear and you do it anyway. Uh, yeah, because I think I have to. Because fear can and does hold so many people back. 
And I think you have to ask yourself, what is the fear? You know, I've been lying in bed at night going, even if I walk out on that stage and they hate me or I forget lyrics or no one's actually going to die, you know, mm. nothing, the world isn't going to stop turning. But how are you going to feel if you get to an age when you know that this was on your bucket list to perform again and you haven't? And I think that would be the biggest regret of my life. So now I go, I don't want to live with regrets. I don't want to. I think my sister Linda having her diagnosis, you know, we lost Bernie to cancer and my elder sister's had it. Linda now, unfortunately, it's gone, you know, it's spread. And I think going through all of that makes you really analyse your life really and and don't sweat the small stuff but and linda said to me don't because i was like well i might do it next year and linda my sister was like you might not have next year you know i thought i'd have years and i haven't so do it now yeah. and that moment i thought yeah you know no one's going to get hurt they might have wasted the money if they don't like me but that's up to them yeah. but um you know, I'm hoping they'll have a great night. And I, and at first it was going to be just a one-off show and now there's 16 dates, like, all over the place. Um, So, yeah, am I terrified? Yeah. But it might be the best moment of my life mm. and I don't want to have missed that. I love that. And I think that's going to reassure so many people out there because people will look at you, Colleen, mm. sat on a Loose Women panel, like, and I see you every week and you look super confident, calm, composed, like you're in your element. And like you said, you are. But underneath that, and sometimes same with me on air, like I'm nervous now. Like I say, I say I'm nervous, but maybe it's excitement. Yeah, I think sometimes adrenaline can be mixed with nerves. Yeah. Sometimes it's adrenaline. At the moment with the tour, I'm thinking, is it nerves or is it adrenaline? You mm -hmm. know, because the two of them are very similar, actually. You know, it's like going on a roller coaster. Every time I've gone on a roller coaster, I'm going up the roller coaster, like the big one in Blackpool, mm -hmm. for instance, first time I went on that. And I'm queuing up thinking, why am I queuing up? I don't want to do this, don't want to do this. You know, and there's people, come on, we can do it. And as I'm going up that, you know, that big incline, I'm thinking, oh, this is the worst thing ever, I don't want to do it. And then you go down that first dip and when you get off, you go, wow, that was fantastic. And I'd have missed that adrenaline, you know. So I, I'm kind of thinking that, just pretend you're going up that first bit and then once you get over the hill it'll be the best thing the best oh, that's, feeling that's inspiring but talk to me especially then. people my age i meet so many people that go do you know i'd love to have gone traveling but i know i'm too old now and i want to go why why is there an age limit to go traveling you know your kids have grown up you've only got you to think about bloody go traveling you know or whatever it is you want to do but i think age comes into it a lot with people as well you know i'm too old i'm too settled well don't be mm. And I, I don't even think it's just age. Like, there's so many things that I could be doing and should mm. be doing. And I just, I, sometimes I just, I don't feel trapped, but I almost trap myself into yeah. thinking that I've got to live this life mm. and I've got to be a certain type of way. And I think, like you said, just don't sweat the small stuff. Life is, life is short, but it's so hard to keep that perspective. And obviously, mm. you've been through some, like, pretty horrific mm. um like traumas in your life. I know, for example, how close you are where you, where you are with your sisters and yeah. I'm close with my brothers. Mm. Um, but talk to me about your relationship with your sisters before we get to that mm. point. Like, what was it like, like, growing up with your sisters? Was it always sunshine and roses or...? <laughs> Do you know what? Actually, for me, it was because I was the baby. Right. So I got protected by everyone and I used to watch them sometimes looking like they were going to kill each other, you know, rowing as girls of a certain age do. Um, and the only one born... In England as well, they were all born in Ireland. Bet you were a golden child, weren't you? I don't know if I was a golden child. I mean, they left me at a club once and didn't <laughs> even realise I wasn't in the car till they got home. How wow. tragic is that? Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, um, it was fabulous. The noise and the chaos. And, you know, we had the untidiest house, really. And But I just have such great memories as a kid. And then touring with my sisters was great. You could never get big-headed because as soon as any of you even slightly said something deverish, you'd be shot to pieces, you know. You'd be like, nah, that's not happening. So it was brilliant. I'm very privileged that... I used to think, you know, when we were touring Japan or just touring here or wherever, God, this... I love touring. It's my favourite thing was my favourite thing, hopefully will be again. Mm. Um, but I used to think, God, oh, this must be so lonely on your own um, because I was, always, oh, I was with my family the whole time. Mm. So it was, I, I've got nothing but good memories, really, of all of that. But, yeah, me and my sisters were still really close. They all still live in Blackpool. They've all gone back to Blackpool, so they're all there, so it's not too far from me and my brothers. 
And now they've got kids and the kids have got kids. There's so many of us, about 30 of them come into the opening night. No way. Yeah. They said, how many tickets would you like for the opening night? You know, they give you a few comps. I went, 30. They went, okay. <laughs> That's incredible, yeah. man. So I just wanted to take a little moment before we crack on with the rest of the episode to let you know about something that I am super passionate about. If you followed me over the last few years, you know I've been on an incredible journey. I've managed to turn my lifestyle completely around and I've learned so much along the way. I've acquired various different tools. I've learned from so many different amazing people. And I've now managed to create my own wellness brand. I can't even believe it myself. Um, it's called Food for Thoughts, and we are now focusing on four key pillars. Nutrition, fitness, mindset, and connection. These are the four pillars that have got me to this point right now. We have just launched our brand new model in January, and it's gone off to a flyer. We've just signed loads of new members, and it's so beautiful to see everybody thriving at the start of this year trying something new, coming out of the comfort zone. And we've got a team of dedicated coaches and an amazing community that are going to help everybody get to where they need to get to. So if you're looking for a lifestyle change this year and you want to be surrounded by like-minded people on the same wave as you, and you want to have access to regular Zooms with specialist nutri coaches, Zooms with myself, guest speakers such as Oli Ollerton, if you want to have regular fitness classes online and be part of amazing events on a monthly basis, then Food for Thoughts is for you. It's also for you if you feel like you're stuck in a rut, you're going around in circles, you feel unsupported, and you want to make some changes, but you don't know where to turn. This is the perfect one-stop shop to get you started and moving in the right direction. And remember, if you want to make some positive changes in 2024, head over to www.f4t.com and take the first step in working towards your very own lifestyle change. Thank you for your patience and enjoy the rest of the episode. So, but my biggest fear is losing one of my brothers, yeah. right? In terms of like, I can't imagine, sometimes like, it's weird, like, I try to imagine it for a minute because I always think like in life, you've got to be prepared for, for anything. And it's so weird, I met someone recently and he talked about in, is it in East, Eastern culture, they teach people that there's no order to when people go. Mm. Like from, a, even from kids, like they're taught that you could go before you yeah. mom or your dad. Whereas in Western culture, we're taught it's from an early be, age, yeah. it's literally all going to go in yeah, order grandparents, like Grandparents, mum and dad, then the eldest child yeah. down to the, yeah. But like we all know it could go I any, know, and any it's other so way. shocking when it does go so when, yeah, the so, other way. But so, so sometimes I try to just imagine it for a minute. And I, when I say to you, it just cripples me. Like, so what was it like, obviously, when you lost Bernie? Oh, God, it was shocking. I mean, Anne, my eldest uh, sister, was diagnosed in 2000 with breast cancer. And um, they caught it really early and blah, blah, blah. And then Linda got it, and hers was quite um, bad at the time, 2006. So she went through all of that. And um, and then Bernie, I got the f we got the phone call about Bernie. But we'd done the tour in 2009. And then she did a show called Pop Star to Opera Star. Um and it was not long, just before that, she'd gone to the doctor about something that she didn't think looked right. It wasn't even a lump, I don't think. She just, it wasn't. And then she found us up and said, it's breast cancer. And my first thought, I didn't say this to her, but I thought, we can't be three times lucky here. You know, because Anne and Linda at this point were so well and... um. And it just took her so quick, really. I mean, she got diagnosed in 2010 and then she passed away in 2013. It's weird because I think mentally, psychologically, I don't think of her as not here. Because she was, she lived in Surrey, so we didn't see Bernie all the time. But she was the real big force of the family, you know. She was the smallest in height and stature, but she was the one that... She'd organise parties, she'd make sure we all got together, you know, she's very, very family orientated. Because she lived in Surrey and so we didn't see her every day, I kept just, my brain was telling me she was still in Surrey. I just haven't heard from her, you know, but then now and again it would hit me. Um, still does, you know, now and again, I think, God, I still can't believe it. Um, but I guess when you see somebody you love go through w what she went through and how she was near the end, for the first few months, probably the first year, it's almost like a relief because you don't want to see somebody that you love being in that much pain or having no quality of life. So initially it's like, I'm just glad she's at peace, you know, mm. because there's nothing more helpless feeling than not being able to do something for her, you know. So in the last, we were all with her at the, at the end and... Um, 
and it was very peaceful for her and there was an element of, oh, gosh, she's just out of pain and that's all I wanted. But she's very much missed every single... There isn't a day, you know, people... My family are very much on her birthday, on the anniversary of her death, that they always put posts out, you know, about remembering Bernie and blah, blah, blah. And a few people have said to me, why don't you do that? Almost like I should feel guilty. But it's because, for me, I don't just remember her on her birthday or Christmas or the day she died. I, a, I remember Bernie every day. You know, I'll think about her at least once a day every day, about mm. something, especially now doing this tour, because Bernie, this was Bernie's passion. She loved it. Um, and that's why I never toured with my sisters again after she died, because for me, she was the Nolans at the time. You know, she was the lead singer and she was just so passionate because they wanted us to tour again after she passed away. And I was like, I just can't. It will upset me so much to go out every night and she's not there. Whereas this one now feels different because it is just me, mm. you know. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there's there's no way, there's no, was, there's no was easy there, um... way. Was there a special moment that you shared? What was the last thing you said to each other? Was there any like? I just I'm always curious. Like, what would you say to your, to your sister? Like, you I remember actually, we were all there. Um, she died at home, at her house at home. They, she wanted to go home and be there, and so we all went there and we were all sitting in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. We'd been there like all day, all night, and then um, we started singing. And she'd been, she was very medicated by then, so she was just in a deep sleep, it looked like. And then we started singing and she went, oh, with her hand. And I went, cheeky bit, she's still telling us we're out of tune. Um, and we all laughed because it was so her, like, shut up, I'm trying to sleep, you know. Um, so. But, we, yeah, we all had our moments with her, mm. you know, um, of what we wanted to say and it was... It was kind of, it's really weird to say because it was heartbreaking, you know, but beautiful at the same time that she, that we got that opportunity. Mm. And like I said to you, and I didn't know this at the time, she had planned her whole funeral start to wow. finish, what she wanted, who was going in what car, where she wanted it. Um, and at the time I thought, oh, my God, she went, she knew, well, she did know. And to be able to have the strength to to sit there and do that. But my God, what was, what the stress it took off everyone. Because no one could argue about it. Mm. You know, no one could say, well, I want to go in that car. Because it was like, well, no, Bernie's told you you've got to go in that car. And everyone got, okay. And, and it made me realise how important it is to have these really, really hard discussions. Because mm. one thing we've all got in common, everyone in this room and everyone in this world, is at some point we're all going. That's the one thing we do mm. have in common. And well, that, we just don't know when. Is it true that you got a cancer scare as well? Yeah, I got a skin cancer. Last got, year? Yeah, so I had a carcinoma on my shoulder, which has now gone. Um, and they had chemo cream on my shoulder, so that burnt that off. Not my shoulder. Mm. <laughs> my shoulder's still there. Um, and then I've got this tiny bit of dry skin here and here. And I've been saying for ages, oh God, it doesn't matter how much oil or cream I put on, it won't go. And then they said, no, that's pre-melanoma. So that will eventually turn into, if I don't treat it, it will turn into skin, you know, melanoma, skin wow. cancer, which is worse than carcinoma. So once my tour is finished, I'm going to get that sorted. Um, but yeah, once again, I mean, I'm not being funny. I laughed when he said it because I thought, well, of course I have because cancer Loves my family. Why does it, though? Is it genetic? What's going on? Well, I don't know. I mean, breast cancer and skin cancer, I don't suppose, are connected. I don't know. I mean, it's one in two people. As Linda always says, when I said to Linda, do you ever think, why me? She goes, no, I always think, why not me? Why shouldn't it be me? It's one in two people. Is it you know? really? Yeah, breast cancer, especially, I think, now is one in two people. I mean, everyone you meet knows somebody with, that's got cancer, mm. whether it's a friend, a family, or a friend of a friend. Um... So, yeah, so getting back to the goats. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I tend it on a laugh, Scott, you, you know yeah, what I mean? You, I know, but you know, I'm just saying you, you seem like quite, like, just really kind of, like you're taking it in your stride. Is that just because you're at a point now where you've been through so much and you just, like, you just got to crack on? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, and, and I think it's very different. You know, I think my sister's got cancer in her brain. Mm. So me coming home going, oh, I've got pre-melanoma, seems really dramatic and pathetic. Mm. So even though it's not, you know, it's not. It's still serious. And if I don't mm. treat it, it will be cancer. But um, at the moment, it just seems, you know, uh, I don't know. People made such a hoo-ha about it. And I was like, guys, 
my sister's cancer spread to her brain. I've got a little bit of dry skin that ha happens yeah. to be melanoma and is treatable. So, mm. um, so yeah, I just can't, I just, yes, perspective. And I can't do it before the tour and there's no rush. If they just said to me, you need to treat that now, I absolutely would have. Mm. But I explained, like, I'm going on tour and he said, no, it's fine. You know, he was so cool about it, this dermatologist. He said, it does need treating. Mm. Um, you know, I wouldn't leave it, but till later years. Um, but it can be treated afterwards. But that's crazy, you know, because I walk through a cemetery every day by my house because it's, it's a beautiful looking <laughs> cemetery. And I always stand there and go, right, if I'm having a stress day or a shit day, and I'm like, right, Scott, look around. And I've got friends who are buried there, some at the same age as me and everything else. And I say, get perspective. Yeah. Right. And I still struggle some some days to get perspective. And it, there's something about human beings where we can't really imagine mm. our own death for whatever reason. We just can't. Well, I don't I, think we want to imagine it. No one wants yeah, to but I don't imagine. think we actually can, though, like physically, like on a day to day basis. And I think one, I just want that perspective in life that life is too short. We hear it all the time. Like, do you know what I mean? Enjoy um, the process. Life's too short, but it's so hard not to get. Of course it is, uh, uh, stuff. absolutely. And as much as I say, you know, life is too short and, you know, put things into perspective, you still can't help being human and things hurt you or things piss mm. you off or you're tired one day or you're angry one day. That's just, you, you've got to have those days as well. But what's good is, is that when it's getting out of control, you know, and then I see my sister Linda just casually going, I'm just off to have chemo, I'll meet you for a coffee after. And then you go, oh. What the, why am I complaining about anything? Mm. You know, she's unbelievable. I phoned her up um, and she said, she wanted me to do something once. And I was like, oh, I can't be bothered, Linda. Why Why do I have to do that? And she went, because I've got brain cancer. And I went, okay, what time have I got to be there? Because <laughs> wow. I thought, she's right. I just can't be honest because I'm being lazy and I don't want to make the effort. But it's little things like that. She She really puts my life into perspective, you know. Um, so, but you can't help being human. You're going to have days where you're still angry or pissed off or sad or, you know, that's, that's part of life. But if you can keep a... I mean, check yourself every Check now yourself now. every now and again. And I, and I guess, and it's awful, and I wish I wasn't in this position, but every time I'm moaning about something, whether it be the bloody tax man is after me again or, you know, I always think Bernie would love to be here with all these problems. You know, mm. my sister Bernie, you know, she was, she was 53 or something when she died. And I thought she'd love to be here now having these problems and wondering how she's going to pay this bill and that bill. But she never got the opportunity. And that will snap me back into a bit of reality and a bit of appreciation that I am still here. You know, yeah, that makes so much sense. I think perspective is is key. Like I said last night as well, like Sunday night creeps in and start stressing about Monday. And I've got I'm, I'm doing this today. Like I love doing this. And, and I've had a busy morning. There's other pressures on me, like in the bigger picture stuff when it comes to business stuff. But day to day, man, like I don't have a bad life, but I think it's the narrative and the perspective that we create for ourselves. Sometimes. I think it is. I also think it's very important to have as many normal people around you as you can. Mm -hmm. You know, because in our industry that we both do now, it's very, very easy to get wrapped up in your own importance. And sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, I had this one fantastic makeup artist called Lee, been in the business years and I used to sit in the chair and he'd go, what's up with you? And I'd go, oh, God, I'm so tired. I can't be bothered. And he'd go, was it the 18-hour shift in the care home that you've just finished? And, <laughs> and literally I'd go, well, well, it's all relevant. And he'd go, it's not really, is it? It's not really relevant. You're sitting in this chair and I'm about to do your hair and makeup for you. Someone else is bringing your clothes in and someone's just asked you if you want a cup of tea. And you're going, oh, I'm tired, I'm tired. You know, and but I love having those people around me. That's why I, you know, obviously I've got celebrity friends. You know, Ruth's one of my best friends when I see her and Brenda and people like that. But the people I on a daily basis around myself with are all normal people with normal lives, normal jobs. And I think, shut up complaining, you know, because I do, I've got to remember that. And I'm not saying what we do, because I do think a lot of people also think it's very easy what we do, and it's not. And sometimes, you know, you're out there on the front line for people to batter you down and call you all sorts and you have to keep smiling and go, oh, yeah, great, thanks, lovely to meet you too. Um, <clears throat> and we do have to smile when we don't want to smile sometimes or turn up when we don't want to turn up sometimes. But on the grand scheme of things, it's bloody brilliant what we do, isn't it, really? No, it is. You're right. And I think 
Yeah, that's 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 just hit me a little bit because I know I have a great life, and I think sometimes it's the it's just the pressure we put on ourselves. Yeah, it is. Um, and the business we're in is pressurized business because we don't know when the next job is. Yeah. We don't know when we're going to kick to the curb for someone that's up and coming, that's come along, especially my age. Imagine mm. being, wait till you're my age and that's happened, and a woman. Um, you know, that happens a lot now. I worry about that a lot. But so we've no guarantees. We live in a very insecure business. So, how, how have you stayed, right? Mm. Like grounded and. How have you stayed relevant as well in this, like, because... I wouldn't say I'm relevant. No, you, you massively are, though. Like, in terms of, you're a household name now. You're on, you're on the TV pretty much every week. And you've you managed to stay relevant your whole career, but you must have seen it change, evolve. I've seen it change and evolve over the last 10 years. Yeah. Like, what made a good influencer a year ago has changed now because now. of TikTok. Yeah. Like, so it's ever-changing. Like, what do you think has been your, like, secret to success? And I know you're probably sat here with your imposter syndrome hat and thinking, <laughs> I'm not successful, but I'm here to tell you you are. No, I, I I am successful. God, I'm not knocking that. I am successful. I don't know what the, I don't know what the key to that is or maybe why that is. I don't know. Um, do, you think I that, think, do you think vulnerable, sorry, do you think vulnerability is your superpower? I think it is. Like, you know, when you sit here, you're so raw, you're so open. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes I'm a little bit like that where... Like your vulnerability is so endearing, so warm, and I think like that's a massive characteristic of yours, which I think people buy into. Well, I think um, I think one of the things that um, people, you know, I mean, when I'm in the supermarket, you know, people come up to me, or you know, even at the train station or whatever, people will come up and go, "You're so like me. You're so <laughs> down to earth, and you, you know, you say it like it is." And I guess, you know, the public are very; they don't get enough credit. And they're very clever and they will they will be starry-eyed about something, but then they'll see through it in the end. And it's very hard to keep a persona up if that really isn't you. And I've never been able to keep a persona up. So people go, you know, people have gone, I get told off all the time about interviews and that, because people go, why did you say that? And I go, well, because they asked me. <laughs> I'm rubbish at, you know, I've never been media trained or, because to me, it's about being honest. You've got to be honest. If someone asks my opinion on something, I'll give it. Sometimes it's massively got me into trouble. Um, and I have gone home and thought, oh, I wish I hadn't said that now, even though I still believe it. I wish I hadn't said it. But I think the public see honesty and I think they see real past all of it. Oh, that makes so much sense because sometimes... And the unreal people always get found out. It doesn't matter whether it's in a year or in 20 years, they will be found out. And they fade out as well. So it's like they basically have their moment in, in the sun and then they fade out where it's real stays yeah. real and stays current and, and gets the opportunities because people just want to see more of that. And I think TikTok's been a massive part of that. Like yeah. the old influencers, even from a year ago, where they post a nice pretty picture yeah. and get paid thousands of pounds. Now people aren't bothered about that. The brands I work with all the time, like the social PR and stuff, they're looking for genuine, real, raw people. They don't want polished content anymore. They want people, they want to see people who are just like, I mean, Olivia Atwood does it brilliantly. Oh, like she just doesn't give a shit. Uh, we talked about this on the last podcast. She's hundred percent Olivia. Yeah, it's people like that that people want to see more of. Yeah, but equally, you know, Olivia's hundred percent who she is, and I love her for that. And she's she's working out brilliant now on Loose Women, and she's just lovely to be around. You know, what you see is what you get with Liv. But equally, there's uh, you know, and I would never mention names, but there's also people that play that. Not Olivia, she is genuine. Mm. But I've seen people play that game. But luckily, like I said, whether it's two years or five years, they'll get caught out mm. if they if they're putting if they're faking it, because mm. you can only fake that for so long, you know. Oh, I bet you've seen it as well, because sometimes, and I, I, I've seen this in the industry, you see people smashing it, and you've probably met them before and gone, they're just not a nice person. They're just assholes. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, how so are they many, doing it? so not a nice many person. Like how, like... and you can't say it, and you don't want to go to the public because <laughs> you sound like you're they're jealous. absolutely talking crap because of the biggest diva or the nastiest person or whatever back you know behind off camera and then and you can't you have to sit there and go yeah they're lovely so i saw i saw a uh, sort of put a caption of a day <laughs> something like it's always the people with the biggest hearts that seem to get hurt the most yeah i think that's true do you know what i mean i think that's true it is and i just think like sometimes it's like you don't want to lose who you are and you want to be you want to be authentic and you want to have an open heart. You want to be nice people. But sometimes as well, you've, 
It's just, you've got to keep your circle small. How big's your circle now? Very small. Is it? Yeah. What, as far as friends and... Yeah. Yeah, very small. Handful of genuine people that I know that will be there till I die. Mm. Uh, very small. Have I got lots of people that I know? Yeah. Um, but I think the genuine ones that you think... You know, I've got a friend that I've had now for 30 odd years, but we can go a whole year and not speak to each other. And then meet up and it's like we have never been apart. Oh. And I know in that year, if I phoned her or vice versa and said, I need you today, they'd be there. Yeah. You know, because she lives down south, I live here. And um, well, it's actually, yeah, it's about 30 years we've known each other. And to me, that's real friendship. I love friends like that. The ones that kind of understand the lifestyle that you live in and you can't give them. Sometimes I can't give my friends as much time as I'd want to. Yeah. I'm not trying to make an excuse for that because I do need to put more time in and make more time. But it's the ones who just don't expect it. And when you see each other, it, they've got your back and it's just like you've not, yeah. do you know what I mean? You've not been away from each other. And, and they just... don't treat you any different now than they did back in the beginning, you know. Yeah. They're, they're, and they're always, they're pleased for your successes. There's never an element of jealousy or you don't deserve it or what about me type mm. of element, you know, they're the they're the real friends, I think, mm. and they're the ones I keep really close in my heart. I've got loads of lovely friends, actually, but there's probably three or four that I know will be there till I die. Mm. And what brings you happiness, right? And what does success look like to you? Like, where, when are you, like, for me, it's like I used to think growing up, oh, I've got to have this big house and this flash car and millions in the bank and everything else. And as I'm getting a little bit older now, I'm just starting to realise, like, like I, I would probably still do the same stuff I do now anyway. You Like, spend yeah. time with my dog. Like, just do the simple thing. Do you know what I mean? Like, what makes you happy? Home. Mm. Home. I'm a real home person. And I think that, that stems from when I was a kid travelling everywhere, you know, um, like I said, from such a young age and wanting to... When we were in Japan and they were going mad for us or Russia we went to as well. We did Russia, all of those places. And I remember then thinking, I just want to go home because I always wanted an element of normality, which I never felt I had as a mm. child. And so now home is the most important place for me. As soon as I walk through that front door, I'm in my element and all those dogs bark and drive me mad and I think I've got to feed the goats, you know. <laughs> They don't care. I've I'm just so done. Sorry, right, right. They just don't care about. I've right. done your podcast. They will be at home now, screaming their heads off, going, "Where's my tea?" Right. Who do you think you are? Just a random thing to have, isn't right, it? Really. Got a few the yeah. Right. So, <laughs> right. So talk to me about these goats. Like, you've got to love animals. What's this all about? So I, Where's I'm always. I, so years and years and years ago, um, it's when I was married to Shane, my right. first husband, and. Um, he was in Greece in Manchester at the time and he rented a farm for us to stay in and they had this tiny pygmy goat. And this was years ago. The boys were babies, really. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, I love that goat. But I wasn't in a position to ever have a goat and I didn't have a house where I could have a goat. And so all, you know, just before lockdown, I bought this new house and it had, a, you know, it's lovely and big garden. I thought, oh, my God, I can finally get goats. Then I realised you have to have, if you're going to have one, you've got to have three, really. Why? Because they can't be on their own. Okay. They're all pack animals. They can't be on their own. So I was looking online and then I found this goat <laughs> and she just had two babies. So I had her and the two babies. I lost one of them recently, but I've still got her. The two boys were called Jack and Dave. Just silly goat names. And she's called Poppy. She was already named Poppy. Didn't really like that, but she answered to it. So now I've got Poppy and Jack. And um, and when I move again, because I've got more land now, I'm going to get more goats. And and I've got horses and I've got the dogs and the cats. And I'd like to, my dream would be to open a sanctuary of some kind. Wow. Or an animal sanctuary. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Please do, because I need you to take these free racehorses off. <laughs> I'm not having them. Me and my brothers have got these I had a thoroughbred ex-racehorse once in my life and I kept it for a year and I did my best and thought, no, she's mad. No, I like, you know, I've got little Irish sport horse pony. He's definitely not a racehorse. Thoroughbreds I wouldn't have, really. But, but, but in, into interesting. I'd rescue them, though, if they you, needed me. You spend so much time, and you have spent so much time in the limelight, and mm. that's your day job. And a lot of people, I think, now, in this day and age, especially, I don't know what it is, I'm, everybody I meet, they all can't wait to be at home. And, like, it's kind of exhausting, I think. What, being at home? No, 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 just, like, the outside world. Like, like 
I love doing this, like right now. And yeah, I, I like, do. I, I feel love like my I'm job. I'm an extrovert. Mm. Right? I'm an extrovert. But in so many ways, I'm also an introvert as well. Like, I, I, I think it's because I give so much energy to what I do that I just crave being at home. Like, when Friday night comes, I love Friday night because it's the one time when no one expects me to work and there's no expectation. Mm. It's the one time when Saturday comes around and stuff, things start creeping in again. It's weird on Sunday as well. But you're not fine as well because of the job you do. It's a lot of talking. Yeah. Sometimes I get home and think, I don't want to talk to anyone. Oh, yeah. And of course, your animals, you don't need to. Just feed them, pet them, yeah. take them for a walk. They don't really want a conversation. So, yeah, I think that's probably it. Although when I left today, the cat had just brought a mouse in. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, and wow. I, just, I just shut the door. <laughs> it sounds like a madhouse. It's an absolute madhouse. But it Mad brings you house. happiness, and I love that. And I think it is the simple things. That's you know, positive, so, really yeah, positive. Yeah, And I feel like, Colleen, you're just on, like... You're on such a good wave in life now, and I think it is a lot of stuff that's happened to you that kind of, that kind of gives you that perspective to just just kick on. And I think that's one thing that I'm going to really take from this podcast is like just feel the fear and do it anyway. Yeah, and just don't have regrets. Yeah, just think about if I'm lying there at the end of my life thinking, I wish I'd have done that, or why didn't I at least try? Because I think we're all everyone is a little bit scared of failure, but I think the failure comes from not even trying. I think that's more of a failure. Mm. You didn't give something a go that you really want to try. You know, I did an interview today and the guy was like, he's 53 and he was like, I've always wanted to bungee jump or jump out of a mm. plane. Now that to me is hideous, but it's something he's always wanted to do. And I'm like, well, just do it then. And then at the end, I'm going to do it. I went, I'm going to push you. I'm going to come and push you off the bridge. Do you know what? It's so weird you say that because I just put a, I put a post out the other day saying that I fancy doing a skydive. I don't know if it's because I'm sober now. I don't drink, so I'm looking for a next bus. <laughs> but I feel like, yeah, I feel like I, I want to do something like that because I've always dreaded that. Mm. Like doing something like that would be like my worst nightmare. But I think, you know what? I'm in a place now where I'm really mentally strong and I want to try new stuff. But I'm going to ask you this question then. So you've got the naked tour then. Mm. I want you to kind of manifest something else now then. Um, and we're going to quote you on this for future reference, something else that you want to do that's on your bucket list that's going to push you out of your comfort zone? Push me out of my comfort zone? Oh, God. I don't know what else could push me out of my comfort zone more than this solo tour, to be honest. I don't... I mean, I've really felt the fear. Um, I don't want to jump out of a plane ever, and I don't want to bungee jump ever. I don't... I'm not that kind of adrenaline junkie. What about the sanctuary, then? Why don't you make that happen? I'd love to do the sanctuary. And career-wise, I'd love to do a show with animals involving, Ooh, you know, animals like Animal A&E or yeah. just something with animals. Colleen sets up the sanctuary. I like yeah. it. Let's yeah, make I'd it happen. Love, right, we're manifesting it. Like, I'm going to manifest it here. And if it happens, we're gonna. I'm going to come back on. We're going to talk about it. Yes. Part and I'm going to say it's thanks to you. Yes. You manifested it. We manifested it. it. Yeah. I'm doing a skydive. You're setting up a sanctuary. <laughs> Let's, I know which one I prefer. Let's end on that note. Thank you so much, Colleen. Oh, it's a pleasure. That I've loved been... it. I actually feel like I've been in therapy, yeah, which is great. A, yeah, I wanted to take you down that route a little bit. Yeah, no, I like it's to great. do that. Um, but I've, I've enjoyed every moment, and you I are have. just so warm, special, humble. Oh, and thank I know you. exactly why you've had such a successful career. Oh, that's really kind. Thank you're just you. Real. You're brand new. Thank I love you. it. Honestly, thank when you so this much. camera turns off, I'm going to turn into a diva bitch. You oh, watch. she is. You watch my demanding. demands. What was your, what was your, what was your rider? She wanted, a, she wanted a bottle of water and a latte. <laughs> Outrageous it was. I said, can't okay. believe I got it. I feel so famous. We asked her what a rider was, and it was a, a, a bottle of water and a latte. <laughs> I went, it's like, we're not exactly got tired of the did you? Know, have we? Um, but all right, thank you so much. Oh, it's Colleen. a pleasure. Oh. Thanks for having me. Oh, that was a beautiful conversation. Um, I just felt like I was at home with my mum having a little chat about life and Colleen is just so warm and I think the standout thing I got from Colleen is just being real and being the authentic you is what's going to bring you happiness and success as well. I think that's a massive reason why Colleen is still around to this day and why she's loved by so many because she just says it how it is and she's just so relatable. But I also love the fact that she talked about regaining self-control. And it seems like Colleen is a little bit like me. She's been a people pleaser all her life. And now she's finally learning to put herself first. And that's something that I'm learning as well at the age of 35. And I wish I, I knew even younger. So if you are listening to this conversation and you do feel like you're living a life sometimes that everybody else wants you to live, Maybe take something from this conversation today. Check yourself and think about what do you actually want to do and how do you want to live your life? And don't wait till the age of 50. Do it now. But if you are over 50, 
live life anyway. That's what Colleen's doing. And that's what my mum's doing as well. Like it's never too late to go after what you want. So feel the fear and do it anyway. That's the caption for this podcast. So thank you for listening again. This has been one of my favorite conversations. I know I say that every week, but they're always so different. But thank you for all your feedback. I see all your comments, especially on Instagram and TikTok um, about the podcast and it means the world. Keep tagging me at scott.thomas um, and I will come back to you. But thank you for always supporting the podcast. It means so much. And I will be back next week with another phenomenal guest. Thank you for tuning in to Learning As I Go and I will see you next week. <laughs>